about a world without music, what would that world be like? Be kind of quiet, huh? There would be no lullabies. Athletic events might be a little less exciting. Right? And most importantly, scary movies might not be so scary. So we all know music is very powerful. It has its own ability to communicate. It has the ability to change how we feel, how we think, how we act. But probably most importantly, music has the power to heal. Music therapy is the skillful use of music to maintain, improve, and restore emotional and physical health. So I'm a music therapist by trade. And I use music to help people with Parkinson's disease move better. So for example, I use specific elements of music like frequency, tempo, accents, to help people with Parkinson's disease move bigger and more forcefully. I also use music and dance to help work on balance, posture, and movement sequencing in people with Parkinson's disease. And finally, I also use music to help people with Parkinson's disease walk better. This is a gentleman with Parkinson's disease and he has difficulty walking and often he freezes when he's in crowded environments. Try to go around that way. And in this case, he's walking in time with the live music. I dreamt I had you in my eyes, and I awoke, dear. And you know, I can't go with him everywhere he goes and sing to him, but he can sing in his head. Pretty amazing, right? He went from not being able to walk at all to being able to walk with music, and then eventually being able to walk on his own with music in his head. So I as a music therapist, I saw things like this happen all the time, and I kept asking myself, well, why does this happen? What is so great about music that has such amazing changes? And so I thought, hmm, it must be about the brain, because everything really is about the brain, right? So I decided to go back to school and study about the brain. And so I've studied for years now, and I will continue to study for years upon years upon years about the brain. And I unfortunately don't have an answer to that question, but I do have a theory. And I believe that it has to do with something called neuroplasticity. So in the brain, there are millions of cells, and those cells are called neurons. And when we have a thought or an action, those neurons send in an electrical impulse or sometimes they don't send an electrical impulse is good. And in order to learn anything new, we need to make new connections between those neurons, and that is called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is also the pruning away or getting rid of connections that we don't need. And music therapy, I believe, has four unique characteristics to promote neuroplasticity. The first is that music regulates neurotransmitters in the brain, right? In particular, I'm interested in dopamine. Dopamine um, has been shown in research to be associated with reward-based learning. And more so, in order for us to learn anything new and make those new connections, dopamine must be present. 
If it's not there, you're not going to make new connections in the brain. So research has shown that listening to preferred music increases dopamine production in the brain. And you think, okay, that's great. What does that have to do with music therapy? Well, as a music therapist, one of the most common questions that I'm asked is, well, what kind of music do you use, right? And my standard music therapy answer is preferred music, right? So for example, if I were, were to use today's greatest hits with the group of uh, people with Parkinson's disease that I work with, they might not respond so well to that music, right? But if I use greatest hits from when they were teenagers or in their early adults, there's a much better response, right? Because actually, that's when musical preferences are kind of developed at that age. So I would use that music when I work with them, and I believe that it works really well because it's increasing dopamine production in the brain. And with more dopamine, there's a better chance that those new connections are going to be formed. The second characteristic that I think is unique to music and music therapy is the actual signal, right? I like to say noise is bad, music is good, right? So noise um, is a difficult signal for the brain to understand, right? So, and research has shown that to be true and that it's really not so good for brain development and it doesn't help make new connections at all in the brain. In contrast, you can see that music is much more periodic and much more structured and is easier for the brain to encode. So let me give you an example, okay? So I don't know if any of you have children. Um, I have two. And when they were little, about two or three years old, I'd tell them, pick up your toys. Go pick up your toys, right? And they would just look at me. Okay, go pick up your toys. Or they would just kind of keep playing with their toys. Like, they didn't understand what I was saying. However, if I did something like, clean up, clean up, everybody everywhere, I'm sure you've heard that song, right, somewhere. It's getting there, right? All of a sudden, it was a miracle. Kids started picking up their toys. They're like, oh yeah, mom, doing it, right? So people would might say that music grabbed their attention. It was more fun with music. That could be true. But I would suggest that maybe for a young brain, the speech signal, which is a little bit more noisy, was more difficult for them to understand. And as soon as I embedded that information in music, which was a clearer, easier uh, information for them to understand, they heard me, they processed it, and they started doing what I asked to do, asked them to do. So what does this have to do with music therapy again? Well, research has shown that professional musicians actually have a more clear, less noisy signal, vocal signal or instrumental signal, than non-musicians. And music therapists are professional musicians. They are highly trained professional musicians that are often trained on many, many instruments and on the voice. And so when music therapists try to change behavior and they provide instructions, those instructions are embedded in a clearer signal, a less noisy signal, and potentially easier for the brain to understand. One of the major principles of neuroscience is called the Hebbian principle, and it states that neurons that fire together wire together. Or I like to say, neurons out of sync do not link, right? So what does this mean? Remember I said in order to learn something new, you have to have two neurons, and they have to make a connection. Well, in order to make that connection, they must send a signal at the same time. They must fire synchronously. Once they do, and they do that repeatedly, they make a new connection. So what's unique about music and music therapy is that rhythm synchronizes neural activity. As shown in this example of two cricket neurons responding to James Brown. Wow! I feel good. 
what cricket neurons are doing, guess, just imagine what was happening in your brain when you were listening to James Brown, right? So as music therapists, one of the key elements that we do is we pair information with rhythm. We present information through rhythm, non-music information with the rhythm, so that we are, again, synchronizing the neural connectivity, or neural activity so we can make new connections in that brain. The final principle that I think is probably the most important is that music can activate the entire brain. You know that you can read music, that's one part of the brain. You can listen to music, that's another part of the brain. You have memories that are associated with music, yet another part of the brain. We can move to music, another part of the brain and emotional response to music, another part of the brain. I could go on and on and on, but I only got you know, a couple more minutes. So music therapists are highly trained to manipulate the music to generate a specific behavior, right? And that specific behavior has to be controlled by a specific area in the brain. So literally, music therapists have the entire brain at their fingertips so that they can manipulate the music and use whatever part of the brain they think needs to be changed dependent on the person's um, behavior. So why does music therapy work? The answer is neuroplasticity. Music therapy uh, regulates neurotransmitters by increasing dopamine in the brain. Music therapy uses a clear signal like music to transmit information Music therapy uses rhythm to synchronize neural firing and, and it can engage multiple areas of the brain. So music therapy is really, really good for the brain and it is the only therapy that can claim these four principles. So then how do I use this theory to explain what I do with people with Parkinson's disease? So Parkinson's disease is the second most common neurodegenerative disease in the United States. And its symptoms look like stoop posture, tremor, stiffness, slowness of moving, difficulty walking, and currently there is no cure. And it is caused by a depletion or a loss of dopaminergic neurons in an area of the brain called the basal ganglia, which is right here. And specifically, the neuronal loss is even in this part of the basal ganglia called the substantia nigra. So when we lose neurons in that area of the brain, it causes an imbalance of neural activity in the basal ganglia. And that, in turn, alters activity in other areas of the brain, specifically in the motor cortical areas. So the primary out put or pathway of the basal ganglia is the supplementary motor area right there. And that area, that pathway is involved with the initiation of internally generated movement. So if I decide that I want to walk across the stage, I do that on my own intent and I walk, right? It's my own intention. So that pathway is being activated and people with Parkinson's disease generally have difficulty with that, those type of movements. However, there is another pathway that we can use for mo movement that involves a premotor area, right? And this area is involved with movement in response to external cueing. So for example, if I'm sitting at the red light, waiting forever sometimes, and then the light turns green, well, because the light turned green, I move my foot off the gas, and I mean off the brake, let's hope, and onto the gas, right? So I actually move in response to an external cue. And that uses the premotor area. And indeed, research has shown that external cues help people with Parkinson's disease move better. 
And the thought is, is that it uses a pathway, an alternative pathway that is less affected by the disease. So for music therapy, remember I have the whole brain at my fingertips, right? Pretty cool. And so I know that I can use music as an external cue and target that alternative pathway. I also use patient preferred music. So I'm increasing dopamine so that we can learn and make new connections in that alternative pathway. And I'm asking my patients to step or move in time with the rhythm. Again, synchronizing neural connections. And it may be up for debate, but I kind of hope I have a clear signal, right? Because I kind of consider myself a musician. So I am basically creating neuroplasticity in this alternative pathway. I'm either helping to maintain that pathway or, let's hope, strengthening it by making new neural connections. So I say, if you're a person with Parkinson's disease, what better way to strengthen that alternative pathway than to dance? <laughs> <laughs>